American Iranian Friendship Council and a few other organizations, I'll name them. Portland Alliance, First Unitarian Church's Peace and Justice Ministry, Cable Community Radio, American Friends Service Committee, PPRC, and others. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome each and every one of you to our forum. This is not the first time we have had an Iran forum um, and other activities. Let me tell you a little bit about AIFC, which is the American Iranian Friendship Council. It was founded in April of 2006 in Portland, Oregon. Several members of the council uh, to AIFC. Portland Alliance, First Unitarian Church's Peace and Justice Ministry, KABU, Community Radio, American Friends Service Committee, and EPRC, and others. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, to you Dr. Ehtadari. Uh, he goes by Gudas, uh, who is essentially the backbone of uh, most of the activities that AFC and other organizations have been able to put together. So. Uh, Thank you, Gudaris. If I don't get a chance to thank you, I want to do that right now. So, Gudaris, it's yours. Um, thank you very much. Um, I can't find Mr. Sharkey in the crowd. Are you here? Okay, here's, uh, let's uh, change the, the course. I will, I'll ask Nancy to introduce Reese to start. Hi, my name is Nancy Hedrick, and I'm here as a representative of Portland Alliance that you can see is one of the co-sponsors of this event and has been a progressive voice as a monthly newspaper in this community for several years. Um, and I've been uh, writing in the Alliance about topics related to the Middle East during the second Bush administration. W led me to it. Uh, so our, our first speaker, is, it's going to be a pleasure to introduce him. He's going to be speaking on a topic of great importance. Rhys Ehrlich is a real journalist in the best sense of the word. He doesn't sit in his office waiting for press releases and backgrounders from the State Department and establishment think tanks. He actually deeply studies the countries and the conflicts that he writes about and provides analysis from a first fiercely democratic social justice perspective. His book, Target Iraq, What the News Media Didn't Tell You, was published in 2003. His latest book is The Iran Agenda, The Real Story of the U.S. Policy and the Middle East Crisis. It's the product of trips to Iran, including one with actor Sean Penn, and also with uh, well-known and locally affiliated journalist Norman Solomon. As an investigative reporter, he has won awards from the Society of Professional Journalists, Project Censored, and shared a prestigious Peabody Award. He writes regularly for NPR, Canadian Broadcasting, and Mother Jones Magazine. He has also been a college-level professor of journalism for several years. I'd like you to welcome Reese Ehrlich. when I visited Tehran to cover the elections of then uh, impending for president of Iran. And I went with Sean Penn and Norman Solomon. Sean went not as an actor, but as a correspondent for the San Francisco Chronicle. And he had asked me to set up interviews and organize the trip. Having, I had been to Iran before, and I was very happy to do that. And so one of the things I wanted to do was to visit the Tehran Bazaar. Uh, the uh, ancient, basically, shopping mall of, uh, of Tehran, where you can buy everything from Persian carpets to food to appliances. And we uh, walked down into the uh, uh, bazaar area, and 
it wasn't widely known. We had no advance notice. Uh, we gave no advance notice that Sean was coming. And our translator uh, turned to me and said, you know, everyone is, is mentioning his name. And I, I could hear, I don't speak Farsi, but I would hear, <laughs> and we, Norman and I, were interviewing one merchant, and uh, we were asking him all the heavy-duty questions, like, do you think Iran is developing nuclear weapons? Uh, do you favor nuclear power for Iran? What are you, who are you going to vote for for president? And Sean walked over, he had been interviewing somebody else, he walked over here, and the merchant turned to me and said, you know something, your friend looks just like Sean Penn. <laughs> Oh my God, it is Sean Penn. I know all, I've seen all of your movies. I, I'm like, oh my gosh, I know everything about you. I know you were married to Madonna. <laughs> so we go halfway around the world to interview Iranians about heavy duty questions, and they want to know about Madonna. We learn and on all of our trips, all of my trips, and certainly on that trip, the Iranian people are incredibly, incredibly friendly to Americans. They were anxious to ask me as many questions as I asked them. They were completely open. I, I always, every country I go to, I make a point of just doing random street interviews. So there's no government minder or uh, agent who can determine who I talk to. And I would stop people at random. And first of all, most people were very happy to talk. So if you're living in the kind of totalitarian dictatorship, that the U.S. likes to describe about Iran, people don't want to talk to foreign journalists. I have been in countries like that. But everybody was actually willing to talk. And it was very interesting. I had one conversation with a, uh, I stopped a woman, because I was writing about Iranian film as one of the topics. And so I was asking about what movies does she like and who are her favorite actors. And she said, at one point, she just stopped. She says, why are you asking me about these questions? Why aren't you asking me about inflation? Why aren't you asking me about unemployment? Do you know how bad unemployment? And she just went into a tear against Ahmadinejad for all of the uh, problems that he was causing for the economy. And that revealed two things, is that when people live under a real totalitarian dictatorship, they do not criticize their country's leader to a foreign journalist, that's for sure. But the other thing was, is the growing discontent with Ahmadinejad and the very real repressive nature, nature of that government. Um, and what I found, and I made a point of interviewing uh, leaders of the independent trade union movement, of the student movement, of the human rights movement, of the women's rights movement, and every single one of them, and these are the people who are genuinely fighting for social change in Iran, to change the system or to reform it. I mean, they have different ideologies and different plans and so on, but they all wanted to see positive change in Iran. And to a person, they denounced the Bush and U.S. efforts to uh, intimidate and attack Iran. So. Everything that the United States is doing to Iran now is exactly working against the interests of the people who actually want positive change in that country. And to illustrate that, I will now take you uh, one, uh, just last year, almost exactly at this time of year, I was in Tehran and had done some interviews and then I flew from Tehran to northern Iraq, which, which is the Kurdish regional government, the KRG. It's the area of Iraq where the Kurds live is virtually an independent state but is uh, formally affiliated with, with Iraq. And it's very interesting that the fastest, the cheapest, and the most reliable way to get into northern Iraq is flying from Tehran. Think about that. It's easier to get from Tehran to, back to uh, uh, Erbil or Sulaymaniyah, the two cities of that area, than it is to get there from Baghdad. And so some months or years from now, somebody in the White House is going to say, oh my God, the Iranians, they're interfering in Kurdistan, and they're meddling and blah, 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 you know. They've had long-standing economic and political ties between Iran and the KRG that are going on today and will go on for, for many years. What I learned, I went to northern Iraq because that's where all the Kurdish Iranian groups are headquartered, the Kurdish opposition groups. Uh, there's Komala and KDP and Pijak. And I'll explain a little bit more of what all that means later. But basically, they're opposition groups with uh, militias and uh, political headquarters in northern Iraq. I wanted to interview them. But before I even got a chance to interview them, what I found out was that northern Iraq is really this hotbed of spies. Everybody's there. You've got Iranian businessmen and spies, and you've got Turks and everybody. So it goes like this. The 
Americans are there spying on the Iranians. The Iranians are spying on the Kurds. The Kurds are spying on the Turks, and the Turks are spying on the Americans. And they all meet in one cafe. And this cafe, I'm telling you, I'm a good investigative journalist. I found it out. It's in an old hotel that can best be, the architectural style can best be described as ugly Saddam Hussein concrete. That is a seriously ugly building. Uh, with big heating problems. But anyway, it's in the, on the bottom floor, uh, there's a cafe, uh, and there's small tables and little chairs, and you can uh, smoke uh, fragrant tobacco through a hookah, or a hubbly bubbly, as it's sometimes called, uh, and you drink uh, really strong black tea, and it looked like something out of like an old movie, you know, like from the Ottoman Empire days, you know, where everybody's smoking hookahs and everything, but wearing the fezzes. And, what I, I like to understand local customs in every country that I come, uh, travel in, I try not to be the typical ugly American. So I was served this strong black tea, and they give it to you in a glass that's about this big. And it's a glass, it's not, and there's no candles, and there's no cup holders. See, in Iran they have cup holders, but here, in northern Iraq, at least in this cafe, they give you this, it's a, a strong tea, and, and it's boiling hot water. So you, you, I was trying to figure out how to pick it up. So you, you go like this, you burn your fingers, absolutely like this, right? And so I tried picking it up by the lid, by the lip, and then the steam comes up and burns your palm. So I'm really stuck now. What do I do? So I'm, I'm looking around and I'm, I'm carefully studying the scene. What you do is you take a, like a, a napkin or something and you pour a little bit of this into the saucer. And then the saucer, open to the air, cools the tea. And then the tea part comes. You take it and you shrub it. And you go, and you look to the right and you see who's spying on you from over here. <laughs> And you look to the left and you see who's spying on you from over here. And that's the way you kind of scope out the scene without being too obvious about it. So I quickly adapted to the local culture. Um, and outside this cafe one day, I saw these four guys walking down the street in civilian clothes, but like uh, easily a foot and a half taller than anybody else in the neighborhood. Crew cuts. I said, these got to be American military. And sure enough, they were American spies. Uh, excuse me, intelligence agents. Uh, they were. Uh, they were very great. They were special forces who were assigned to spy uh, on whoever, probably on the Iranians, but you know, I'm sure the Kurds as well. And uh, what was, became very, very interesting when I kind of pieced all this stuff together, a few days later when I drove up into the Kandil Mountains. Now the Kandil Mountains are the range that borders Turkey, northern Iraq, and northern Iran. And it's where the PKK guerrillas uh, are located. Now, a year ago, when I first started talking about this, nobody had ever heard of the PKK, nobody had ever heard of the Kandil Mountains. But of course, more recently, because of the Turkish threats to invade northern Iraq, they're much in the news. The PKK is the Kurdistan Workers' Party. It's a Turkish-Kurdish group. They carry out raids inside Turkey and also across the border from northern Iraq. They kill Turkish soldiers, they have killed civilians, they blow things up. Uh, and they are denounced as terrorists by both the Turkish government and the United States. They're on the official State Department list of terrorist organizations. Now, PKK has a branch called Pijan, which is the Party of Free Land, Free, Party of Free Life, which is the Iranian Kurdish section of the PKK. And they, they, they do the same thing in Iran. And that is they go across the border into Iran, they kill revolutionary guards, they blow up buildings, they kill civilians. But they do that with the arms, but being trained and armed by the United States. So on one side of the border, you have the evil, evil terrorist PKK attacking good, good Turkey. And on the other side of the border, you have the same group doing the same thing, attacking Iran, but they're the good, good freedom fighters attacking the evil, evil Iran. So the hypocrisy of this knows no bounds. Um, and it, it's not only angering the Iranians, it's angering the Turks who are saying, well, wait a minute, we're capturing the PKK with American arms that they're getting from the Pijan, and you're claiming that you're siding with us to fight the evil terrorists if it don't wash, right? So people in the area know about this covert war. It's all over the Turkish press, it's all over the Kurdish press, but it's by and large a secret here in the United States. Now, Seymour Hirsch has done very good reporting on this topic uh, in The New Yorker. I've written about it for Mother Jones, a few others have as well, but by and large, it's because it's denied in Washington. Uh, it's, it, it's a story that's not reported on. Um, and for the New York, so the New York Times is concerned, it's not real until somebody in the CIA admits it. 
So it doesn't matter what's happening on the ground. It's when somebody in Washington says it's happening, well, then, then, then we'll print it. And so far, that hasn't happened. Um, ABC Television News, to its credit, did an investigative report about a similar group in Baluchistan. Now, Baluchistan is on the southeast corner of Iran, close to the Pakistan border. And Baluchis are an uh, ethnic group within Iran. And there's a group called Jongola, which is, um, has gone, it, it took credit for uh, traveling into Iran in February of this year, blowing up a bus, killing 14 Revolutionary Guards and a bunch of civilians who happened to be around them at the time. Um, this group is also funded by the United States. That's what the ABC uh, report uh, showed. And it's led, get this, by a former leader of the Taliban. Remember the evil, evil Taliban that we're fighting? Al-Qaeda, Al-Taliban, oh, 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 my God, horrible, horrible. Uh, except when they're freedom fighters fighting against Iran. So the U.S. is willing to ally with anyone uh, uh, in pursuing this uh, covert war. Now, the ethnic minorities of Iran have very real uh, grievances and, and legitimate complaints about the central government. They, approximately, nearly half of Iran is made up of ethnic minorities. The Azerbaijanis, for example, are oppressed. There was an article in the... Um, a horrible article in one of the leading newspapers of Iran comparing Azerbaijanis to cockroaches, and there were huge demonstrations in the Azerbaijani regions. Um, the Kurdish people and the Baluchis and others face very real discrimination by the central government, and they have very real uh, and legitimate demands against that central government. Uh, but the United States seeks to use some of the groups in the ethnic communities for carrying out its own ends. And that is a very, very dangerous game, because that's what the United States did in uh, Afghanistan in the 1980s. When the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, the U.S. funded and armed the most reactionary of the Muslim fundamentalist groups because they were the most anti-communist. And those were precisely the groups who later evolved into Al-Qaeda and the people that the United States is fighting in, in Afghanistan today. So it's a very dangerous game. They, the U.S. thinks they're on top of it, uh, but a lot of these groups have their own agendas uh, about what they want to see uh, happen. So, excuse me, the U.S. is waging this covert war, um, not talking about it, and it's getting the people in Iran very angry. The U.S. Um, tries to demonize Iran, uh, claiming that, uh, trying to justify a possible military attack uh, against Iran. They use a number of arguments, and I'm going to go into those in just a moment. But the, thing, the key thing to keep in mind is that this is exactly the situation that the, what the U.S. did prior to the run-up to the Iraq War. Remember the Iraq War, where the evil nuclear weapons and chemical weapons that Saddam Hussein had, and the weapons of mass destruction, and blah, 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 blah. And everybody was convinced, in, in Washington at least, that this was happening. It turned out, of course, all to be lies. The aim was to overthrow Saddam Hussein's government, and then from there you backtrack to figure out what are the arguments that are going to resonate most with the American people, and maybe people in Europe. Uh, and, and would kind of work. Well, the U.S. is doing exactly the same thing in Iran. The goal is to overthrow the Iranian government, not in order to establish democracy, but overthrow in order to install a pro-U.S. regime of some kind. Um, because if there's actual democratic elections and free democratic choice, the people of Iran would not choose to ally with, uh, with the United States, certainly not to open up its oil markets and, and establish military bases. They had that once with the Shah. They've been through that. They have no interest in doing that again. Um, so that's the goal, and what the Bush administration does is uh, flail around for arguments that will work to justify that policy. So the first argument, and, and the one you've heard uh, a great deal about, of course, is that Iran is developing nuclear weapons, that it's, sorry, that it's a, a danger to the people of the United States, that um, how we cannot possibly tolerate uh, uh, a nuclear-armed Iran. Uh, Bush, in a September speech, said that if Iran even has the knowledge of how to develop nuclear weapons, it will cause a nuclear holocaust in the region. Now stop and think about that. I bet you there are people at the universities in this fair city who have the knowledge of how to build a nuclear bomb. That theoretical knowledge doesn't get you anything. It's building it that's the hard part, um, as any country who's tried to do that has found out. So, um, it's, it's a bogus argument. Um, the Iranians say they are simply developing uh, nuclear power. Uh, they say they don't have um, enough oil and gas uh, in the long run to 
um, sustainability alternative uh, energy sources. And of course, that was exactly the argument that the Shah made in the 1970s when the U.S. virtually insisted that Iran develop nuclear power. That's a little bit of history that, that is often forgotten, but the United States demanded that Iran develop nuclear power. Why? So they could sell them nuclear power plants. And the Shah actually had contracts for 10 nuclear power plants with the U.S., Germany, and France prior to his overthrow. And by the way, the Shah periodically talked about wanting to have nuclear weapons, but that didn't cause a, a, a single blip in the Tel Aviv or Washington at the time, because it, what, you know, the Shah was a U.S. ally, and so, so what's the big deal if he had nuclear weapons, although he never actually developed them? Even if you believe that Iran is consciously trying to develop nuclear weapons, or might sometime in the future, the CIA says they're at least away, at least until somewhere around 2015, before they can get nuclear weapons. Uh, and so, what's the rush? Why does the U.S. have to talk about bombing now or cranking up the pressure now? It's obviously a phony argument that's being used because to scare people, basically, in this country. But it's precisely because the, the Iranians are clearly so. Oh, and did I mention that the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the one organization in the world that actually has inspectors on the ground and actually knows the situation in Iran, says consistently they have no proof that Iran is developing nuclear weapons? But that doesn't get a lot, of, a lot of play because that runs completely counter to everything that the debate that's going on in Washington. The uh, second argument, when, when the atomic weapons argument doesn't kind of wash or go, get too far, they came up with a new one starting basically in January of this year, that Iran is responsible for killing American soldiers in Iraq. And there's these highly sophisticated weapons that the Iranians are arming, their Iraqi allies, and with the Shia militias, and maybe the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, you know, they kind of mush it all together. And evil, evil terrorists, anyway. And they're killing American soldiers. And we can't allow this to go on. Now, the brilliance of this argument is that not only does it make um, Americans afraid of Iran and have another excuse, but it, then if the U.S. chooses to bomb Iran, they don't have to go to Congress to get another resolution because it's an extension of the Iraq War. See, they're just carrying the fight to the enemies who are supplying the Iraqi insurgents and therefore does not require a new congressional vote. That will be, that will be the argument if they ever get to that point. You know, it's really funny. In, in the old days, um, you had to actually be attacked before you went to war. Do you remember that? And, and so it, it was like you didn't have any choice when you went to war. The United States had a choice because it, Iran, in fact, was not a threat. Uh, and, uh, but also what's very interesting now is that just as they kind of crank up the argument that Iraq is being supplied by Iran, now they're cranking it down again. Now they're saying, oh, we see signs that Iran is not supplying so many weapons. Well, if they didn't have any proof in the first place, it's easier now to, to ratchet it down. The argument was that the uh, Iranians are supplying EFPs, or explosively formed penetrators, which turn out to be copper disks, which are machined in a particular way. The, the argument is the Iranians are shipping these, sneaking them across the border. You attach an explosive device to it, you plant it in the ground, it blows up Humvees and armored vehicles. And it's a very effective, indeed a very effective guerrilla uh, tactic. What the U.S. doesn't talk about is that this EFP has been used all over the Middle East in other previous guerrilla wars. And finally, just the other day, an American general admitted that, in fact, they're being manufactured in Iraq. So every time they claim they have one of these EFPs from Iran, they can't tell the difference between some where it's been manufactured. So they just make it up. They just make it up for the reasons that stated. And then the third argument uh, that, that resonates particularly strongly uh, in the Jewish community, of which I'm a part, uh, and in, uh, I think, uh, among wider sectors of people as well. And the argument goes something like this. Ahmadinejad is the new Hitler. He has stated that he wants to wipe Israel off the map, and that uh, someone, uh, Hitler, and, and that Iran is the new Germany, and that if even the thought, a small chance of someone like Ahmadinejad having a nuclear weapon uh, uh, would, um, would be horrific. It would be the end of the Jewish people, the Jewish state, and therefore we have to bomb them to take them out before we do that. And in forums like this one, I've even been asked, uh, well, if you were, alive, and these are by conservatives who say, well, if you were alive in the 1930s and knew then what you know now, wouldn't you have taken out Hitler to prevent the Holocaust? And my answer to that is, you know, it's you and your forebears who supported Hitler in the 1930s. So let's keep that straight right away. It was the conservatives 
who backed Hitler, who thought he was providing a new model of uh, a new society in Germany, and also wanted him to fight the Soviet Union. So there was no effort to stop Hitler at the time when he actually could have been stopped. But more importantly, a, a simple argument, and stop and think about it. If Iran really wanted to offensively attack Israel and wipe it off the map, why hasn't it already attacked Israel with conventional weapons? It has bombs, it has planes, it has missiles that could wreck a lot of damage in Israel. The Israelis and the Americans claim that Iran has chemical weapons, although there's absolutely no proof that that is the case. But let's say for a moment it is. Why hasn't Iran attacked Israel with chemical weapons, which would wreck even more damage? And the reason is, is because that's not Iran's policy. It's never, they, they, they have not offensively attacked anyone in, I don't know, 200 years? Long time. Um, and the second reason, besides it's not their policy, if Iran ever did that, it would mean an immediate retaliation by Israel and the United States, and it would flatten Iran. It would wipe it off the map, and it would kill most of the leadership. And the people in Iran, are, the leadership in Iran, are angry, but they're not crazy. They're not about to launch a war that's going to guarantee the destruction of their own people and their, their own country. So it's a very cynical argument that the leaders in Israel and leaders in the Israel lobby here in the United States, I think, know that, that Iran is not a threat to launch an offensive attack against Israel. What the real agenda is, is that they don't like the fact that Iran supports Hamas in the Palestinian territories, and they don't um, like the fact that they support militarily and uh, with money Hezbollah in Lebanon. Now remember, it was just last year that Israel and Hezbollah fought a war, and Israel lost the war for the first time in its history. Remember there was a, a battleship that was sunk by a Hezbollah missile, missile or it was uh, disabled, I should say, uh, taken out of action, for the first time. And that was something that appeared at the time and then largely forgotten about because it's so embarrassing. Uh, and Israel wants a rematch. They want to go back in and take on Hezbollah again, but they want it with Hezbollah with both hands tied behind the back. And the idea is that you bomb Iran, it weakens Iran. They won't be able to resupply Hezbollah. They won't be able to get involved there, leaving the, wide, the area wide open for Israel to go back in and, and settle things once for all. Now, that's just as, as delusional as Bush's plans for Iran, but that, that's what the real issue is there. But, you know, if you go to the people of Israel or the United States or around the world and you say, well, you know, we're going to bomb Iran because there's army in Hezbollah, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't fly. But if you say, we're going to bomb Iran because they're going to kill all the Jews, well, then you might get some more support. And that's exactly why that cynical argument is put forward. The, um, in, starting in August and September, the United States upped the ante, the rhetoric, about uh, bombing Iran. And I think they came the closest yet to actually launching that attack. There were enough ships in, off the coast of uh, Iran. Uh, they had the military plans. I don't know if you read the article in, in the New York, uh, sorry, the New Yorker by Seymour Hirsch where the, the military had already targeted uh, the various the nuclear facilities and the um, Revolutionary Guard camps and headquarters. They were going to attack parts of Tehran. It was really going to be a horrific, devastating attack. They were even talking about sending in some U.S. troops to bomb certain facilities and pull back out again. So it was very advanced. It wasn't just theoretical. It was a very advanced plan. But they, run in, they ran into a really, really serious problems. And I see indications over the last few weeks that they may be at least temporarily backing off from that plan. And I'll explain why. The first thing that happened was the U.S. had absolutely no support from anybody, anybody around the world with the exception of Israel. But other than that, there was nobody. Do you remember, by the I just put it by parenthesis. Do you remember the Coalition of the Willing? Does anybody remember that? Yeah, that was a, that was all the the new year, the all the allies, the important, all of whom have gone home, right? Uh, Australia voted out the Howard government. They're going to pull part at least some of the troops out, um, and the U.S. is left with what uh, Poland and Tonga as our staunch allies, and they can't even get Poland and Tonga to agree to bomb Iran. So nobody, including Britain, the staunchest of the lap dogs for for the U.S., is supporting the U.S. on, on a bombing. Second, uh, the, uh, there's a fierce fight between neoconservatives represented at the top by Dick Cheney and uh, the kind of conservative realists, people like Condi Rice and Gates at the uh, Department of Defense. And the fierce debate is not over the 
objectives or the strategy, but over the tactics. In other words, they all agree you should, we need to overthrow the government in Iran. They all agree that it's perfectly okay for the United States to do that. They all agree on the covert war that I've just described, but they differ on the tactic of bombing. And the, the realists, including some leaders of the Pentagon uh, and the uh, intelligence agency, said, look, it's going to be a disaster if we had bomb Iran. The price of oil is going to skyrocket the minute the first bomb drops, and it may or may not come down. The U.S. is already facing the possibility of a recession. And one more war is going to really tip things over. Uh, the U.S. troops in Iraq are going to come under serious attack, including shelling into the green zone, and, and it's going to be a free fire zone against U.S. troops from both Shia and Sunni factions in Iraq. And there very well could be a new war between Israel and Hezbollah. So you take a limited uh, confrontation between Iran and the U.S. in Iran and you spread it throughout the region. So even the realists, uh, as bad as they are, realize what a disaster that would be. So there's been very fierce infighting, and you can tell when there's fierce infighting because they're all leaking to the various media. See, the one side leaks their, their position, then the other side leaks their position, and it's an indication of a very fierce battle going on. And the third, and the third factor that should not be underestimated is the, that of the American people. The sentiment in this country overall is very much opposed to the war in Iraq, as opposed to a possible a new attack on Iran. Roughly 100,000 people not marched uh, maybe six weeks ago against the, the Iraq war in major cities across the United States. There is a real grassroots effort opposed to war uh, growing around the United States. <clears throat> and they do pay attention to those kind of grassroots efforts, even though they try to pretend that they're ignoring that they're above it all, and that Bush is all powerful. He's not. So the combination of those factors, in my estimation, has meant that they've, they've ratcheted it down a notch or two from where it was, uh, say, a month or two, uh, two ago. So what are the indications? They pulled back some of the uh, ships from the Persian Gulf. They released uh, nine hostages, Iranians, that have been basically kidnapped by the United States in Iraq, including two diplomats that have been uh, uh, taken out of a consulate, an Iranian consulate in Erbil. Um, they switched the, you know, the $75 million that the United States allocated to so-called promote democracy in Iran. You heard about that. It's gotten Iranians really mad because it's an effort to, to undermine the genuine democratic movement there. Uh, that's been switched out of the control of neocons and into the State Department, where it's basically been backburned as a failure. Uh, so there's a serious, and, and oh, and now the U.S. is claiming that Iran is, is not uh, sending so many weapons or is not responsible for so many U.S. deaths in Iraq. Uh, not with any particular proof, but just yet another assertion. But what's significant about that is that it's, it's a sign that the U.S. is ratcheting down the pressure. And then we've had the uh, Annapolis Conference, so you're not going to bomb while you're trying to bring people together to settle the Israeli-Palestinian uh, dispute, despite that ain't going to get anywhere, but you can't bomb right then. And then, of course, since this is a war of choice, it's not a war, it doesn't have anything to do with actually defending the country against attack. You could choose when to bomb, and the U.S. doesn't bomb during Christian holidays. Let's keep that straight. So, I think we've, we've slid through until at least January 2nd. That I think we're not going to see any bombing of Iran. Now, that doesn't mean that the, the danger has disappeared, or that they couldn't ratchet it up uh, in, in, in the spring, you know, sometime after the first of the year. But I think it is significant for those people who sometimes get discouraged and think that Bush is all powerful and he can ignore the Constitution and he can ignore the, co the Congress, etc., etc., and he can do anything he wants. Well, no, he can't, actually. He, there are limits to American power, and I think this is uh, one example of it. That's why I consider myself a, what I call a sober optimist. And that has nothing to do with my drinking habits. Uh, but it has to do with that I try to look soberly at the situation in Iran, in the United States, in Washington, among the people here, and I, yeah, I remain optimistic, because when historians go back 50 years from now and they look at this period, they're going to see that the Iraq War was a serious turning point in the decline of the U.S. Empire. It's going to at least rival Vietnam, maybe be more significant than that. It has stretched the U.S. armed forces beyond belief. It's wrecked the economy. It's destroyed any allies and alliances that support the United States that might have had abroad. And it may well have per not permanently but seriously wrecked the Republican Party. Um, the, uh, the National Review had an article, you know, catas the coming catastrophe, <laughs> about how they're looking at the, the chances for Republicans in 08. You know, it's no small thing. I think there's seven U.S. senators and 27 congressmen, all Republicans, are not running again. 
for office in 08, because they see the handwriting on the wall. They're going to get some of that lobbying money real fast, you know, and, and they're ducking out to make their bucks, because they see they're not going to get reelected. Uh, and that's another reason to be optimistic. Um, and the, uh, um, I see a real grassroots movement. I've had a chance to, by the time I finish up in Seattle tomorrow, I'll have visited 20 cities around the United States on this book tour, and I've had a chance to speak before groups like this. I've been in more churches than I have in my entire life. Uh, <laughs> like I said, I'm Jewish. I, I can't even name the Protestant denominations where I spoke, because uh, they're all the glorious people over there. Uh, who, who they, anyway, they're good people, I love you, and I have no idea what your religion is. Uh, and the, uh, you know, I, I spoke at college campuses and community groups, and um, there is a real grassroots roots movement that is, I think, is coming together, uh, that is in, in, uh, opposed to the war, and carrying out local actions. And it hasn't coalesced yet nationally as a significant movement, but I think it really will. On October 2nd, uh, my hometown of Oakland uh, honored me with a uh, Reese, declared October 2nd Reese Early Day. And I'm going to explain about my sober optimism. So I was trying to figure out what people should do on Reese Early Day. And at first I thought I would come out and wave to the throngs in front of my house. Uh, but they never showed up. I guess they didn't. They got the directions wrong or something. Anyway, and so I thought uh, I had to go to. Um, my dentist that day, by coincidence, and so I suggested to him that there should be free dental care on Reserve Day. <laughs> we, all, we all know about the crisis in health care, but what about the crisis in oral hygiene? He didn't like that idea a whole lot. Um, so I, um, you know in that film, uh, um, Michael Moore's film about the healthcare care industry? Sick of it. And in it, there's this great scene where we learn that, that congressmen never actually read the bills that they uh, that they vote on. And I actually talked to a, a former congressional aide in the Midwest, uh, part of the tour, and he told me that even the aides don't often don't read the bills. So uh, most of the legislation that passes in the United States, is, uh, nobody's ever read it. You know, very few specialize, which is one of the reasons it's so bad. Um, so I decided to put the Open City Council to the test on this question. They asked me to write a, um, a draft of the research day resolution. So I sat down and I wrote, uh, you know, whereas, research, blah, 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 research, blah, blah, whereas, 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 therefore be a result. And this is absolutely true. I said, therefore be a result. Um, the city council of Oakland agrees to pay for free drinks for anyone within a 10 mile radius of City Hall on research day. <laughs> It turns out they actually do read the resolutions, because <laughs> uh, they cut that part out. <laughs> Once again, reinforcing the fact that I'm a sober optimist. Uh, so, what I really did do, however, <laughs> on that day, is I worked with a couple of uh, Oakland City Council members to uh, introduce a resolution that put the city of Oakland on record as opposing bombing of Iran, and uh, calling for the speedy withdrawal of U.S. troops from Iraq. And I'm happy to report that on November 6th of this year, the City Council of Oakland unanimously passed that resolution. And it became the sixth or seventh city nationwide to pass such a resolution. A couple of cities have had a popular referenda on that. Again, it's part of that grassroots effort to, uh, to, to pressure um, the administration from below. I think in the the, the top level Democrats, uh, Clinton, Obama, Edwards, unfortunately don't take a stand all that different from Bush when it comes to Iran. And but there are people in Congress. Uh, there are certainly people in local government. There are certainly people among uh, uh, the general population who are very much ahead of these top level Democrats and Republicans on, on this question. And I think with a real grassroots effort from below of organizing demonstrations, and I know here in Olympia, Washington, they, they sat in to block the shipments of uh, the military supplies in the Fort Lewis. 
um, the city council resolutions. There's a wide variety of tactics that people can adopt that are appropriate for your particular area. But building the key thing is to build that grassroots fire under the politicians and to force whoever comes to power uh, in um, 08 uh, to force them to rescind this absurd policy towards Iran and towards Iraq. And uh, what I hope if you take away just one lesson from today's talk is that you join me in being a sober optimist. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Chris, uh, it was really a pleasure to hear how he presented his opinion on this issue and um, it's very important for all of us to not forget that there are very many Americans who are putting their life and their time and their energy in promoting the concept of peace and tolerance and engagement. And Reese and many others are among them, and you are all from that uh, group and category. Uh, as France, in the beginning, uh, introduced our organization, actually established by people who have been to Iran, who have traveled to Iran, and who have this cause and this issue at the bottom of their heart, and they are putting every day of their time on this and uh, we are thankful to all of you. Uh, it's a great honor for me to introduce to you Mr. Ali Shakiri, who is a great friend of mine. I had the pleasure to work with him on many projects in the past. And uh, when last year, around the, the first week of May, um, I heard uh, through email uh, that our this year, yes. Uh, I was actually outside the country. I was in Prague, sitting in an internet cafe, and I was checking my emails before I catch a train to back to Berlin. Um, and I got an email from a friend that Ali has been arrested. It was just two or three weeks before that uh, when uh, several of our uh, mutual friends contacted me that um, Ali's mom had passed away in Iran and we want to put a uh, condolence message in one of the online papers. And of course, uh, several of our, uh, of our friends and um, political activists, I, I want to call them, um, much more famous than I am in the Iranian scene, they, write, they wrote this uh, message of uh, sympathy to Ali and then now we were really faced with uh, a sense of uh, scare um, of whether that initiative may work against him in detention. And uh, so there were, there were plenty of uh, talk about how to deal with this situation. As you know, three other Iranian Americans were detained in Iran. Um, at least three of them, uh, I'm sure, had no intention of working for uh, American government in this aggression project. Uh, I don't know about the fourth one. But uh, three of them were seriously working for engagement and working for promoting the peace and, and tolerance. Khaled Sfandi Ali from Woodrow Wilson and Kian Taj Vash from Soros Foundation. Um, they were all announced that they are part of a Velvet Revolution project by the State Department. And as you know, uh, Condoleezza Rice asked for $75 million, and then Congress gave them $85 million to spend on this democracy project. And we knew that uh, Ali Shakiri, who is just like me, working uh, on his own volunteer time to promote the cause of peace, is a peaceful man, uh, would never do such a thing. And uh, we have been knowing each other at least through the projects that we have done. Um, so it was something unbelievable for any of us. Um, but I heard that uh, after a few months, 
um, his son finally broke the silence because there was this fear of uh, anything you do may work against him in prison and you don't know really why he is detained. Um, when finally his son decided to go out publicly and uh, uh, talk about it, uh, he wrote that my mom calls to my dad's voicemail to hear his voice. It was so bad. I know that none of us becomes victim of this type of tyranny and for no good reason. So, it's really an honor to have Ali here tonight with us and he will draw the picture from the Iranian side of the equation. Um, as far as I know, he had met with many Iranian opposition leaders while he was in Iran. He traveled to Iran because his mom was ill and unfortunately she did not uh, really stay uh, for long. So. But he uh, spent the rest of his time in Iran and visited many opposition leaders and he has contact, he has had contact for, for, for long. So uh, we will hear from him. Uh, he is a founding member, an active member of uh, an organization at the uh, University of California Irvine called the Center for Citizen Peace Building. And that's the organization that we really went out and uh, set up, helped set up a website for him and uh, called, that was the only um, American organization in addition to individuals who wrote letters and asked for his release. And uh, you heard the name of the other uh, two especially obvious and very more often because of the work of uh, Mr. Hamilton, the director of Woodrow Wilson. And uh, so, um, after all, he was released after 150 odd days and he can talk to you about uh, being in a solitary confinement for so many days and months. And uh, um, so without further ado, this is Ali Shakiri. Good evening everyone and I think in just a moment to get the break and you know change the environment. But I was really enjoying listening to Reese Ellen. It was educational and it was a learning course for me. But uh, what good as my friend did, he made me cry. But I want to make it this way for all of you. I'm not really making empty compliment. I just took it. I just lost 25 pounds. Nobody could do it with no charge. And they paid for it. <laughs> I just didn't anybody ask me what happened to you. I just, I went to solitary confinement. And when I came out after 140 days, my niece told me, Uncle, I wish if I would take this course. Because <laughs> you lost 25 pounds, which is, I gained it back like five or six pounds on 40 days I've been here. Anyway. I would like to say good evening again to you and I would like to thank American Iranian Friendship, Portland Alliance and First Unitarian Church and KBOO Radio, Community Radio, I thank you so much and others and especially good as my host and my friend, thank you so much to all of you and, uh, and to everyone which take this opportunity in this kind of chilly weather in Portland coming that long and uh, waiting that long. Uh, it's uh, joyful to me and honored to be a co-panelist with Riz Helic, which he presented and performed uh, an educational performance. I really enjoyed and I thank you so much. As a Iranian American peace lover and a Iranian American, which I always advocating three elements in my project, always in the last at least 10 years and last decade. 
I, won, I was active of creating dialogue, normalization, and engagement. Those are the three elements, which if you would do it, is going to be better for both national interests of Iranian and American. Let's get to the point, because after what he presents, let's uh, make it shorter than uh, if there is a question. I'm pretty sure there are some questions. I'll be so happy to respond. You know that uh, relationship between Iran and U.S. is not friendly. Not from now, since 1979. And you know that after the revolution happened, U.S. did not recognize it at first. And you know, unfortunately, after that, American embassy was invaded by, invaded by Iranian students. And because of that, or after that, who knows because of what, Iran a lot war started, backed by U.S. in this eight years war, and you know, one million casualties, human casualties, was created for Iraqis and, Iraqis and Iranians. And because of that was happening on that time, it was some opportunities in the past. Opportunities for Iranian, they miss. Opportunities for American, they miss. In these days, in every responsible citizen mind of Iranians and Americans, it's a big question. What's going to happen? Is war inevitable or avoidable? Answering to this question and making us to think not as a peace creature, as a somebody wants to invest for better life, invest to gain back from what we do. This is a question which will be followed finally what we have to do about it. No, first, for, getting, for going and answering this question scientifically, we have to know what's going on. Iran is a rising power. For more than quarter century sanction, in Iran didn't work. Why is rising power in the Middle East? It's natural and normal. For many, many years, when Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, and when those radicals being in Afghanistan, where was the safe haven place for Afghanians? You know, let's go with Iraq. All the leaders of Iraq on the last three decades, they've been living in Iran. How many prime ministers we had on the last four or five years, four years after invasion of Iraq by U.S. troops? Like seven or eight prime ministers. Have you seen any of them take any harsh position against Iranian? No. I just want to remind you, Nelson Mandela, we, we took a trip here, they asked him to take a position against Cuba. He didn't. His response was what? When, I, when we needed help, when African National Congress needed help, the only country was helping us was Cuba. And President of American National, uh, African National Congress came to U.S. to meet with Schultz, State, uh, State Department of uh, Reagan. He did, not, he did not meet with him. The same thing is going on in Afghanistan and Iraq. That's the one factor. Iran is a rising power. But what are we going to do with the rising power? It's normal. Sixty-something percent of uh, Iraq and they are Shias, and we are preaching democratic process. Whom they going to vote for? Remember, in last, since 1776 Independent Day, and since 1789 our constitution was passed, in more than 230 something years, we had one Catholic. His name was Kennedy, and he did not make, and he did not make it through. Do you expect in Iraq when they may go to the election day? And go to the ballot, they're gonna, when they go to poll, they're gonna write a ballot, so needs to be a president. It's impossible. Let's be realistic. 
افغانستان بیا به سمت جوش ما تو بیا به افغانستان اسلام ریپابلیک و افغانستان اسلام ریپابلیک و ایران اگر واسه پام بگید ایران هم یو اس دس وان فکت الان در فکتر ایس انفرچونتلی رایزین پاور اوی این نیمیز که یه در تری پرابلمز وان فور سنیز سنیز گورنمنت این میدل ایس They are facing with this dilemma because of the first time in the century, in the last century, in contemporary history, in Iraq, as an Arab country, we have a Shia power. It's the first time in the history. In the last contemporary history, 20% of Sunnis live in Iran and Iraq. And now we have a Shia power. Sunnis power now in Iraq, in the in, uh, Middle East, they are not happy about it. I understand that. Let's do something about it. Another thing, rhetoric of Iranian against Israel must be over. We have to do something about it. How? And the third thing is the conflict and confrontation environment between Iran and U.S. These are three elements which Iran must deal with. That's now we have a vibrant movement in Iran. I'm so optimistic. not under the influence of any kind of alcohol. I'm so optimistic by the fact which is doable. Then answering to the question of if is war avoidable or inevitable, the answer is avoidable. How we could do that and why we have to do that? Let's go and talk to the American rationalists which they are thinking about American interests. Ask them what you're going to gain by attacking Iran. Let's think about it for a second. Disaster. Powerful force, they could do anything and everything, and they would do it for, for their survival. Is that situation going to be better? Maybe somebody in 2002 could say yes, but you know, after two, in 2007, after what we saw in Iran, which the country of 25 million, Iran is 70 to 75 million, with the country which that time when the U.S. attacked Iraq, Iraq did not have an army to defend, and the country behind like Iran is that powerful, what could happen? Worse. The same thing for Iranian is damage to the Iranian interest. In this case, I'm thinking and working on the common ground. What's the common ground? One, Iran must help us and could help us and they already showed they are willing to help us, us as the U.S. Americans, in a situation in Iraq. Besides the rhetoric, Iran could do that. We should not turn them away. I give you the one of the example in 2003. They had a reformist president in Iran. His name was Mohammad Khatami. He brought a great part bargain to the table. with negotiation with Americans. I'm quoting what Armitage, Deputy Secretary of State to Colin Powell, indicated in Frontline a few weeks ago in PBS. Say they call it great bargain. Why? It was offered to solve the problem of peace in Middle East. It was offered to solve the problem of Hezbollah and Lebanon. And it was offered to solve the problem of relationship between Iran and U.S. And also, the U.S. was going to give the incentive Think, uh, solve about the problem of enrichment of uranium, which many, many Iranians, including myself in Iran, we believe suspension of the, uh, enrichment of uranium in Iran is needed, and we have to go toward the suspension. But atomic energy is different. They need it for their future. But In this moment, we have to suspend it until the understanding and mutual understanding between Iran and the U.S. establish versus misunderstanding. Okay, we, they had a great bargain on the table, they were working on it. What happened? Armitage said, in the State Department, we call it great bargain, but unfortunately, end of the week, we got the order from above, which they say, they now say it was a vice president. White House, Say no. Then what happened? The Iranian government find out, okay, look like the soft version of dealing with Americans by Fatimist version is not going to work. 
Let's go with hard work. Do they have any, anything to do? Just that way. Nothing else they have to do. Let me clear this one for saying that Israel has to be swept from the earth. I remember when I was a child, my daddy told me, if somebody going to beat you, he's not going to say, I can beat you. Because you know he's going to beat you. But we have, whenever I, I done something wrong in, in my childhood, my mom says, I wish you are not going to come back. I wish that happened to you, I wish happened to you, that happened to you. In Iranian culture, we call it nephrine. That's exactly what Amadejan is doing. What he don't ask you? You know, he said, he said, this conference needs enrichment of uranium in 100%, not even in 4%. 4% could create electricity. For, having, for doing that, we have to have a source, resources first, technology second, and manpower the third. Iran has none. Iran has none of them. This resource of the uranium, we are in two places in Iran, six, 600 tons in Bandarabas and 800 tons in Sabaz Yazd. 1400. They could have 1400 tons of yellow cake. 1400 tons of yellow cake. If you want to know how small is it, I give you an example. You know how much Australia they have? One million tons. Do you know how much Canadian they have? 600 million tons. This is nothing. They don't have uranium and they don't have the equipment to enrich it. And third, they don't have technology and also the manpower. What do they need? For Canadian energy, for uranium, which they really needed, they need to enrich it in certain limit which they need a relationship with West to make it. Another word, Ahmadinejad is a symbol of frustration of the boy. He's the kid, he's saying, give it to me, give it to me, I need it, I need it, I need it. Then the response is negative, then he says, we will do it tomorrow, we will do it day after tomorrow. This is just chanting and rhetoric. Unfortunately, the U.S. intelligence service, they know about it. But they are giving us this, this impression that Iranian power is endangering Israel or America, which doesn't. And what I think is, in this environment of misunderstanding and confrontational, if we don't work toward solving this problem, we're going to have lots of victim for strangling, for strangulation of human rights and democracy in Iran and taking the right of the Americans in the U.S. But in Iran it's really serious. In the last two, day, two years, any person, any individual, any organization, any patriot would think about Iranian national interests, would like to oppose Ahmadinejad, he attacked them and called them non patriot He called them our national security is in danger and forget about freedom of press, forget about freedom of speech. Continuing in this kind of confrontational environment, we get more victims from intellectuals, from the builders of Iranian society. I am one of a small example of this kind of situation. My arrester was on the base of national interest, which they thought I am invented in their national interest, and thanks, thanks to everybody, inside and outside, family and friends, organizations, governmental and non-governmental organizations who helped, and uh, my release happened. And also, the main thing, I could convince them in, in 140 days of interrogation that it's otherwise. I'm not a threat to national security of Iranian, or I'm not a threat to national security of American. That was important in my situation. I would like to conclude this one.
this my presentation and be ready for answering some more questions and go in detail of the Iranian fraction, political fraction, what's going on, what all the opposition in Iran think. But I would like to uh, say that solid treatment, just be honest, besides rationality, I just would like to just for a couple of minutes express my emotion regarding uh, solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is agony. Prison is not a place to rest. It's not a place to live. It's just a place a struggle to survive. Solitary confinement, you have nothing to do. You just pacing across the room, reading the book, which I was able to read 37 books. And also trying to think about the bigger issue which occupying your mind and doing something better. When some people they ask me, how did I resist and keep my dignity intact and not confessing something they wanted me to confess, which was wrong to say that I'm, I sold myself to any power. Because of on that situation, especially at night, because there you cannot, you don't recognize day and night. In solitary confinement with no light, you cannot realize what time is it. But at more, on that moment when I was resting, I was thinking, your issue is a small issue, and you are part of the international confrontation issue, which is much bigger. And this confrontational involvement between Iran and U.S., and Ali Shakiri as a dual citizen who's been advocating peace, human rights for the last few decades. This, they, uh, this, that's a main, that was the main reason of my arrest. But through the interrogation, I convinced them I am not. And through the help of the others, I convinced them. But do you think I'm going to be the only one? I'm not a friend of ours. They've been arrested last week. Another friend, which I met him two days before I'd been arrested, for just one minute, I just said hello to him and I'm gone. He was arrested while I was in jail. But we are in separate cells and we don't see each other. The only person I saw for 140 days, it was a God bringing me food, medicine which I don't have any complaint about the guard, about the food server, and about the uh, medical providers. I don't have any complaint, be honest by myself, and I've never been physically harmed. But solitary confinement is torture. And I would like it to be recognized. Don't even think about water boarding, that's baloney. If somebody has a question, not knowing that torture is, obviously everybody knows it's torture, but solitary confinement is torture. But on that moment I was thinking, should I have a revengeful feeling when I come out? Should I have a grudge? I find out no. When one of the news media asked me, are you changed? I said yes, I changed in a complimentary way, but not in a contradictory way. More talk of peace, more talk of dialogue more sort of normalization and more sort of engagement. Dual citizenship, to be honored that I spent most of my adult life in the U.S., born and raised in Iran, gave me this opportunity and privilege to be a small bridge between Iran and the U.S. It's not just preaching. If you don't, have, if you don't want to have a victim on both sides, and if you want to have an enjoyment of investment in Iranian society, we must go toward the peace and love. In conclusion, I would like to say, I don't want to add, I have different presentation, but after a thorough uh, lecture and presentation and performance, which I've been honored to listen to it by uh, Mr. Illick, I think I let the question come then I would answer, but in conclusion I would like to say if something going to happen, it's going to happen within nine months. 
If you would like to do something, you have to do it yesterday in a say today. What CEO Portman need is a role model for the other cities in the nation. What the grassroots are doing is perfect. But we have to work harder and harder and harder. Anything you do, any instrument you have, any possibility you have, any kind of any person you could reach, any governmental officer, officer you could talk to, any legislator you could write to, encouraging them sophisticatedly that peace is needed. U.S. is going to lose more for with policy of isolation and confrontation with Iran. That's why I disagree with any kind of, with any kind of resolution was passed recently against Iran. All of them, they are wrong. One calling the Revolutionary Guard terrorists. Look like calling Iran a terrorist. You are calling a country terrorist, and I want to change your regime, and you want to ask me if it's all it's kidding. And all the resolution passing and against the banks and sources in Iranian, Iranian banks is wrong. Not inviting Iran to the conference in Maryland was another mistake. Iran calling U.S. big Satan, great mistake. U.S. calling Iran acts of evil, this is disaster. We have to stop cursing each other and we have to work toward the peace. And thank you so much for your time and I appreciate your attention.